Hi, I'm Rob Vanstone, and welcome to the 63rd edition of the Rider Rumblings video podcast. We are very pleased and honored to have with us today CKRM football analyst, Saskatchewan Rough Riders alumnus, Michigan State Spartans alumnus, Applewood Heights Secondary School yeah, absolutely. alumnus. Absolutely, yep. <laughs> uh, Luke Mullinder, did they wear green too at Applewood Heights? No, nah, we wore uh, red and blue. Oh, yeah. Well, you grew out of that pretty yeah, quickly. Yeah, pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Luke. It's great to have you with oh, us. Oh, it's an honor, man. And that intro music, it's like it's there's breaking news somewhere. And, Is it? Uh, it it's turns ins- out it's your podcast. That's, so, that's it's sick. great. It sounds like uh, the old uh, ABC Nightline theme. Yeah. I, keep, I keep waiting for Ted Koppel to come up. But unfortunately, <laughs> it's it's me and it goes downhill from there. But we're here to save the program. So thanks, Luke. There's I a lot of pressure on you right now. Appreciate the invite, man. Um, I'd like to start off um, uh, by... Uh, paying tribute to, and p- expressing condolences to the family and friends of Hugh McKay. Uh, he was uh, with the Riders for 21 years. I just want to make sure I got the title right. Manager of F- Facilities and Stadium Operations. Uh, Luke had, I mean, uh, 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 Hugh did so many things with the Riders and did did them all with a smile on his face. He passed away suddenly a few a few days, right before the Montreal game, not, not yeah. long before the Montreal game. And uh, just a shock to everybody in the organization, everybody who knew him, uh, just a absolutely funny uh personable individual uh anything, anything you'd like to say about uh, you uh it's a it was an absolute shock you're right i think that uh most of the riders found out or the guys that were in montreal at least found out probably a couple hours before the game i know i found out when i walked into the stadium and one of them sat me down i was like hey I just, you know just before we get rolling here i want you to let you know that Hughes passed and uh man he was uh such a good dude and you're right he I mean everybody knows him for like the fact that he knew every single detail of of both stadiums uh you know like the back of his hand but I I got to know Hugh after my football career a little bit especially with my dealings with the F Troop who are all a bunch of great guys they they do so much work that goes unnoticed and unthanked within every stadium event especially the football games and uh Hugh was just a great dude man everybody loved him um he was always there to try to try to provide a solution for whatever was was going on or whatever worry somebody had uh he was so easy to talk to and just uh to me he uh he exemplified people in Saskatchewan just uh, a hard working um nice uh just cool dude and uh it was sad and uh yeah i i'm i'm a little bit I'm I'm saddened. Uh, in no way am I saddened as much as the organization is. I mean, those guys spent so much time around Hugh, and so um, you have to support again the friends and the family uh, of the man. But uh, yeah, it, it was a sad day, and uh, surely it, just moving forward, it'll be it'll be tough without Hugh. Yeah, I just I can't think of a time, even if it was just we were passing one another, there'd mm-hmm. always be a quick comment back and forth. And we'd always be chuckling as as we mm-hmm. went in different directions. Even yeah. if it was a, just a five second hello, yeah. Hugh McKay made your day better just by having that brief interaction. Yeah, he's one of those guys that would that would literally try to say that he wasn't doing anything. You know, he'd be like, "Hey, what's up, Hugh?" And he'd be like, "Oh, well, you know, just trying to avoid working hard." And yeah. but you know, he was he was saying that in jest because you know how hard he did work. You he's know patching I mean? up Taylor Field yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He would say that. <laughs> Meantime, he was he was shoveling crap like he he was that dude. And uh, yeah, he's gonna be missed. Yeah. So to the just to use family and friends, just a real loss and just a tremendous guy. I wanted to make sure right off the top that we acknowledged uh, Hugh McKay and uh, what a, just such a great guy. So, Absolutely. Um, not an easy segue turning from that to football, but that's ostensibly why we're here. Uh, Rough Riders are coming off a 17 to 10 victory uh, over the other team of which you were in alma mater. Yeah. yeah <laughs> the yeah. Montreal Alouettes. Uh, 42 minutes plus before the game was called. There's been a lot of talk about uh, whether that game should have been called mm-hmm. when it was. Uh, they waited an hour after the, the thunder and lightning delay and then an hour and maybe a f- couple of minutes and then that was it. Yeah. And then uh, you were interviewing coaches and players. Yeah. Yeah, it was a quick turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> what did you make of all that? Oh, I... <laughs> I was, it was weird as a broadcaster because you really didn't know how to end the show or how to even go through sort of the delay. Like, for instance, that long delay in Mosaic this year um, at home, it did not matter how long it was because you knew it was going to, con- the game was going to continue at some point or they were just, right, they would figure out something yeah. to end because it was the first half and, right? But here, it was the end of the third quarter. You knew they had changed the rules at some point. 
And you knew that if, if it stayed like that, and it probably was because we kept hearing from the stadium guys who were walking in, yeah, this isn't going to go on, guys. Like, we've never seen this much red and, and yellow on the uh, radar maps. And I've been here for 22 years, things like that. And yeah. I've never seen it like this. So it was just weird. Um, but me, I always try to put myself back in, in, in my old football cleats. And I don't know how I, I would have been cool with the W as a rider. I would not have been cool with anything as an Alouette at all. Um, but I, I kind of felt like we should have been given a little bit more time to, to wait because it didn't seem like um, – I get it. Like, I get the player safety. I get the fan safety for sure. But one hour seemed like a, sh- a very short time to wait, especially, again, from the being in former cleats. Oh. If it was seven points. Like I really, I tweeted it. I felt like the last three minutes of that game were going to be awesome. I felt like the game was going to totally change pace. I felt like uh, Montreal was going to be forced to start going to the air a lot more, and in by doing that, they were going to stop trying to disguise things that they were doing, and they were just going they were just going to have to. And the riders, they were going to get they were going to get in a position where they were in a question. Okay, do we continue up with the pressure package that we have, or do we drop back in zone and and make um, the quarterback that's in there? just complete passes. I felt like we were going to see a, a, a change of events and I was excited about it, but unfortunately we just weren't given that. And, and that's from a player, you, you, what you're so disappointed. And I, I remember being involved in a game in Calgary. You, you'll probably remember it where we ended in a tie after two overtimes. I remember feeling sick. Like there was, yeah. because you're just in this. Like, that was over John Chick was good. Nailed yeah. for rough in the past against yeah. Henry, right? Yeah. You only get 18 opportunities as a professional athlete in the CFL. You only get 18 opportunities to put something on tape. You know, people are always concerned about the win and the loss. Uh, but one of the other concerns is, is a lot of these players have incentive based contracts. A lot of right. Yeah. Like uh, what are you, uh, what are you going to do about losing 15, actually 17 minutes of your, of, of your, of your one opportunity that you only get 18 of to put your stats together. Right. Because everybody's like, oh, yeah, team first, team first, stat second, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what comes first when negotiation time comes around with your agents? Yeah. Stats. February gets here. And yeah. How many <laughs> touchdowns stats. did you score? How exactly. many tackles did you make? Yeah, exactly. So all this team team is great and you need team and you need to figure out how to bond the locker room. Yes, absolutely. That's imperative. But at the end of the day, it's a business. And in February, like you just said your agent has only stats. Well, that's 17 minutes where there's players out there that aren't able to go and get the stats that equal more dollars in the Canadian football league. So it was just, it was, it was just, it's sad on a lot of levels. And I, I just felt like you, myself, Ryder nation, all your listeners got robbed of a really cool finish. What I don't get is how in July you can wait for two hours and then resume the game. But in August you wait for an hour and, and pull the plug should the league I, re, I understand what's in the new protocol mm-hmm. but given that being done should the league not be make sure that it is seen to be doing everything possible mm-hmm. to get that game in? i once sat through a rain delay at yankee stadium that was like two and a half hours oh. i read most of a book yeah. but then the game resumed i said that on air um major league baseball shoot They'll they'll delay the game for the day, yeah, and and they'll just pick it up back, right? But it's it's those rain delays last forever, yeah. But yeah, you're right. And one thing that you can hope that the league makes the adjustment on is that they do it right because this commissioner has been known to okay. There's a fix we need to make. We've recognized it right now. Let's not wait till next year to do it. Let's make it right now so this doesn't happen again. So hopefully they'll figure out some way because you can't play a mini game for one quarter, right? No, that's what sort of the, the new law says that, Hey, you'll play a mini game if it's in the first quarter. Well, the second half is the most important, especially that I always say on our broadcast and it's, this is Mark Tressman's thing. This is not mine, this, but, but it's, it rings so true. There's 57 minutes in a game. Plus that final three minutes, that last three minutes is, is a football game in itself in the Canadian Football League. Um, and that's where you really get lost. You can't rob the fans of that because the fans, they invest so much. That last three minutes is so unique um, to the Canadian Football League that y- you have to get it in if you can. I grew up watching, watching Ron Lancaster. Mm. And I saw so many games where Ronnie for 56 minutes was basically throwing interceptions to anybody who, want, who wanted mm. one in the opposing secondary. Yeah. But in those last three minutes, mm-hmm. he would kill you. Yeah, he, would, he could do more 
with with a minute, with a minute and yeah. a half, with one final possession. And that's the nature of the CFL game and one of the things that makes it so in, endearing mm -hmm. and enduring. Yeah. And yet just it's almost cavalierly wash away 17 minutes. And it's not like they had to wait forever to get in three quarters. They just mm. had to accommodate yeah. 17 plus minutes. Yeah. It's not like there was, you're not asking a lot yeah, here. There's, I mean, there's the only concern you had was for the TV time, but I mean, you've got five channels yeah. on TV, right? You can, you can run the chance. You can run the rest of the game on one of your, your five channels and, and then focus on the Edmonton game and, uh, uh, that was going on on the other four. Right. So it's not a matter of, Hey, well, we were concerned for TV rights. Well, what do you got five channels for? So again, it was just, it was just a shame that, uh, there, I, and, and believe me, if it was on the flip side, if oh, the riders had been losing by seven, can you imagine? This would still be talked. We'd be oh. still. I'd, I would have woken up. You would have woken up today <laughs> and been like, "Oh man, we've got this podcast to do, and we're gonna have to talk about this for the entire however long it is." Because Saskatchewan would be on a, in an outrage right now. Yeah. Like so, thankfully, it was just the Montreal fan base that was, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we get to." But that's tough when you've got a fan base that you're trying to engage and one that you're trying to – the interest – markets that you're trying to reignite. You've got the ownership situation in flux. So mm -hmm. you're trying to sell a team. Mm -hmm. And and then all this happens. It, yeah. It's – yeah, there would be more outrage and furor in Rider Nation, but that's a franchise that really can't afford to have a lot of things go against it yeah. right now. Yeah. So – You're right. You know – one thing that it's easy to lose sight of amid all the, amid the circumstances is the, is the fact that riders have won four in a row. Yeah. They're now five and three. When they were one and three, I did not see this happening. Mm -hmm. I did not see any of this happening, which I guess speaks to my lack of prescience. Mm -hmm. But uh, right from training camp, listening to you on on the broadcasts on Sports Cage, um, you've been pretty confident mm -hmm. in what this team has. Um, what has allowed that, what you the confidence you'd express to be mm. ultimately borne out on the field. How have they done this? Uh, well, I mean, the first thing that, that kept the confidence going was the fact that, um, granted that Chris Jones was a humongous piece of the puzzle here. Uh, when he left, nothing went with him other than him. So, but those, I mean, the head coach, the defensive, the defensive coordinator and the defensive prowess, the scheme that left. And obviously the, the way they were scouting and, and bringing in guys had changed, will change a little bit. Obviously those three are huge, but I mean, for the most part, this is a staff that's been together for the last five, six years. They won a great cup together in Edmonton. So you kind of knew that when you're together as a unit and, Yes, the head of the snake might have left. I mean, you still got a lot of components there that understand how to win. And what made it really intriguing was because that staff had been there and figured out how to win, and they knew that not the first part of the season wasn't important, but they knew it was all about how you finished. And that's why I wasn't panicked when they were one and three. Uh, they, I mean, if you look for the, the three years prior to this, they hadn't started well either. No. But one of the things that they were really good at doing was finishing so strong. This team has finished the, the, over the last three years. There has not been one CFL team that's wanted played that's wanted to play the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in that final six games, right? So you kind of kind of knew that the foundation was there to still have that same result, but it was going to be different because the head coach was a lot different from from Chris Jones and Jason Shivers. Although he was there for six years with Chris Jones. This was his first shot at being a DC. But one thing you understood definitely, one thing there was nothing, no mystique, no aura about was the talent that was still in the locker room. This was still a very talented team. And you knew J.O. was was just salivating it on an opportunity like this. So there were many exciting parts coming into it. But the foundation, the players, the core of the locker room, it was there. So they had a shot. It wasn't like the core left with Chris Jones just Chris Jones left. Right. So that's why you were, you were really optimistic about sort of the, the riders chances. And the other big one is you knew the rest of the league was going to take a severe step back. Yeah. Which has happened. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've, they've really dropped the ball in terms of this taking off the pads in practice, all, all regular season. You're starting to see that just so 
and it's and it's in the bad regard. Like you're starting to see the results. This tackling has just been absolutely terrible in the Canadian Football League, to the point where it's not the year of the return. It's it's the year of the missed tackle. It's the year of the terrible fundamentals, right? So you knew that because the league lost four of its best coaches, including Chris Jones, Mark Tressman, Wally Buono, right? It, you know what would be fun? You know what's funny, Rob, is that it, the what are the lines right now? One in seven. If the Lions were one and seven and Wally was still there, you know what we'd be talking about? Oh my goodness, can the can the Lions do this? Yeah, like they did. Hey, remember in two thousand eleven, they yeah. won the Great Cup when they were saying. But because Devon Claybrooks and 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 Ed Hervey went and hired a bunch of buddies that they played with, what are they saying now? Oh well, BC's BC's BC. They'll they'll be out. They're already out. We've got two teams that people are already saying are out, and it's it's literally the yeah. week nine. So because the rest of the league was going to step back, you knew the riders, it was okay because they were just going to, they were so still going to be within that pack. It wasn't like last year where the league was at the highest point. Last year was the best league in C- C- I've ever seen in the CFL since being here. So in 2004, it was wow. the most competitive league I've ever seen. So that league didn't stay the same. It wasn't the riders were the only team that dropped. Everything dropped. So if everything drops, you still got a shot because yeah. you're right in the middle of it. Who's elite now? I'm not sure I see an elite team. Winnipeg is 6-2, and two, but they've had their <sighs> stumbles in recent weeks. Uh, Calgary isn't what Calgary once was. Mm-hmm. Hamilton is, is leading the East, but is certainly mm-hmm. vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, I don't see – Edmonton is solid, but I don't mm-hmm. see greatness there. I don't – and that's I – don't, I don't actually see an elite team either. Yeah. I, I really don't. I see, I see an elite coaching staff. I see the Red Blacks. I mean, that's – they're going to keep their hopes alive with that coaching staff. I see Calgary's coaching staff. If you ask people around Cal- the Calgary organization, when they lost Devon Claybrooks and had to replace him with Brent Monson, they were they, there were some people that were like, "Oh, we're just going to be, we're going to, we might be better." Yeah. Um, because br- apparently Brent Monson was the guy that was really helping Devon Claybrooks. I mean, you look at his experience; he's he's a guy that's been there for a long time and done a lot of good things. So, um, yeah, I mean, there you're right. There is no real elite team you can tell i mean there's teams struggling right now i mean look at look at how bc's struggling okay and their response so far has been to trade devon coleman for sean lemon that'll do it what <laughs> that tells you is well where's the talent if there's no talent coming into the league how what are, how if there's no talent coming into the league because if we're reaching back and going for sean lemon who by the way it wasn't wasn't playing because Corey Chamberlain didn't like him. If you look at him on film, he slowed down, right? But if we're trying to up our chances by going getting Sean Lemon instead of if there's a hopefully there's like maybe he they're just bring him in there just to be a guy in the locker room to bring some experience and there's this young stud that they're waiting. That's what you're hoping for. But yeah. I doubt there is. But they've had problems on the, on both lines all year and they persist in front of Mike Riley. They gave Riley a bit better protection against Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Uh on Saturday, but uh, it's still not a great offensive line. They keep trotting out the same no. group, and and the defensive line has just been a sieve all year. What yeah. has changed? And uh, you know as well as anybody, games being decided on the line of scrimmage, and both lines of scrimmage for the Lions are just well below I mean, below average, and, and hence the results. It's funny because you don't always want to go back and point the finger at coaching, but I mean, there was a time I think three games ago where BC got so frustrated with the inability to block for Mike Riley where their offensive linemen just started cut blocking like every play. Like like it was 2001. They were yeah. literally cut blocking all the time. And you're looking at Brian Chu and I'm like, you know what? That would probably would, would have been Brian Chu's response when he was a player if he was struggling with somebody is to start cut blocking. But that's what coaching isn't. Like it's not, okay, what would I have done if I can't block a guy? Well, I would have cut. Hey guys, we should all start cutting. Let's start deep cutting. No, it's okay. What else? What am I not getting out of Figueroa, right? Like, what is he good at? Okay, he's good at get. Maybe I should adjust his steps, steps to where instead of sliding back, he slides to the side, and now I'll give him a chance to envelope a player versus versus go athletically one on one. Right? Just yeah. I'm not saying that's the answer, but to see them cutting, just you saw it. Oh, they're in their last resorts now. They're just trying anything, and and if it was three weeks ago, it was week five. Like, come on, that it's you got to do better. I keep thinking of George Cortez in 2013, and granted that offensive line they had that year was tremendous, but how often did they go with a tight end or two tight ends? Yeah. And they would build in max protect for Darian, yep. and Darian would have, okay, pick your target. Do you want Chris Getzlaff? Do you want Weston Dressner? Do you want mm-hmm. Taj Smith? Do you want G-Roy? Do you want Rob Bag? 
Uh, and Corey Sheets is going to eat you up too. You're absolutely but right. George Cortez had so many fronts that were beyond five men. Mm -hmm. Why can't BC bring in some George Cortez uh, right. ingenuity there? And because they don't have George Cortez, yeah. they got Jarius Jackson, who's in his second year, and Jarius Jackson's dialing up plays where it's second and seven plus. He's dialing up plays where the quarterback's going to have to throw – the quarterback's first receiver is going to look back at him in about three to five seconds. But mm, because of what the defense that. is doing, <laughs> he's only going to have two seconds to throw the ball. And Jarius Jackson is not making the connection, and he's too young. Like, George Cortez isn't going to do that. Look at the Montreal Alouettes under Mark Tressman when they were at the height of their power. There was a tight end, which was an offensive lineman. There was Kerry Carter, and there was a running back. And Kerry Carter was either going to stay in and block, which would give him essentially seven guys blocking for AC, or Kerry Carter was going to run a simple flat route or, or some sort of short route. And AC's choices were going to be SJ Green, Ben Cahoon, probably Ben Cahoon, and Jamel Richardson. That's it. Don't even look at anybody else. You got seven-man protection, and you got three guys to throw to. And we'll give you time to throw to them. Absolutely will give you time to throw. So start giving these guys the time to throw and you might have a chance to actually get the ball out. Don't put it on the quarterback. Don't give him a, a six-step drop where he's going to have three seconds of time and and tell a receiver. The first, I mean, some of them, Rob, I don't have, I'm not a genius. I don't look at film like, like, like I might see things on film that other people don't see, but it's apparent to everybody. I mean, when your first receiver is looking back at the ball finally once he's passed the sticks, but the team that's playing Playing you is sending two more blitzes that you can block you're not gonna have time to get to that first receiver there's got to be things built in but that's not bc's system right? we look at montreal uh, i think the second the um the sack by that, that led to the touchdown by earl okine we, we didn't get the all 24 on the tsn telecast mm -hmm. but if if they had another second, Cunningham was wide open deep. It looked like, but there just wasn't going to be time for nope. him to get the ball to Cunningham. And that didn't matter that he was open deep. You're absolutely right. And that's on that's a little bit on the old line and the running back. Okay, well, hey, listen, because schemes schemes aren't just, hey, we got to block left or right. Like a lot of schemes identify the middle linebacker. That's why you always see guys like Dan Clark going out there and pointing, right? So whether it's the middle linebacker or, or the most important person um, in terms of where they want to put their blocking scheme towards, that's what Dan Clark Clark will point out. So offensive linemen will have their numbers. So for instance, that guy coming off the edge, you, some people saw the right tackle or left tackle just totally ignore that guy. Well, that left tackle either missed his block or that wasn't his responsibility. He was supposed to get the inside guy and there was supposed to be someone coming in off and blocking the edge. Or it was on the quarterback because the quarterback, after the old line identified who they were going to blitz, needs to know, or block, needed to know who is coming free. And that happens a lot of time where the quarterback says, okay, yeah, we got these, my old line's got these six guys. Here's the guy who's definitely coming free. I'm not going to have time to look down this way or this way. Because I know this guy's coming free, I've got two options. And it'll be either running back, it'll be a quick slant, right? So, so, but that wasn't being identified in Montreal. And that's why the Riders took advantage of it. It's pretty sweet for the Riders, right? You get a free shot on the QB like that. I'm a defensive lineman, man. The, de yeah. the defensive <laughs> lineman had both touchdowns in that game. It was a perfect game for me. <laughs> Would that be uh, that? That'd be, a, that'd be a, a wonderful occasion for a defensive connoisseur oh, such as yourself. It was. It was uh, again, and and that's why we got cheated out of it. Yeah, because uh, there were so many good things going. I know people want scoring in the Canadian Football League. I get it, and I understand it. Um, but th there was a really good defensive game going on. Uh, a lot has been made, you know, you talked about Jarius Jackson. Well, coming into the season, there was a lot of talk about Stephen McAdoo and a lot of it was very mm. dismissive and a lot of it was very critical. A lot of it was emanating from me and mm. people like me who just figured that that offense was just doomed to hitch screens and punts for as long as Stephen McAdoo was mm. here. What has he done this season that has more closely resembled what he did in 2017 mm. when the Riders led the league in touchdown passes and in 2015 when he was the offensive coordinator mm -hmm. of an Eskimos team that won the Grey Cup. It's, it's like, it seemed like a lot of that was glossed, a lot of his successes were glossed over amid the obsession with mm -hmm. what happened last year when the Riders did virtually nothing offensively. Mm -hmm. What has changed this year? Well, they've, they've got a quarterback um, and, they've, they, and more importantly, I think they've got consistency at that quarterback position. Uh, the offensive line's playing well again. Um, you, you, there can't be enough said about Shaq and Kyran um, and their developments from their first year in the Canadian Football League to the second year. That was that was the problem last year. You saw so much talent, but it was so much young talent. Yeah. Right. Um, and when you bring in guys like Manny Arsenault, 
right? Um, you bring in a couple more vets that understand how to win. I think that they have a lot of balance now with Powell as, as they're running back. Um, again, balance isn't okay. They, they just ran six plays. Three of them were runs. Three of them were passes. That's balance. No, that's not balance. Balance is th- the, a team having the threat of a, a running back that can break anything open at any given time on the ground or through the air. Right. And that's balance. So if that, if there's, if there's a string of three passes in a row, there can be a fourth pass in a row, but that fourth pass in a row, one of the reasons why it happens is because the team still has to be concerned for the run, for instance, right? The, because at any time this running back can break a run, right? It's like Andrew Harris having Andrew Harris, right? Is uh, there, he is an absolute threat at all moments. So I think that that's a big part of it. I think that Stephen McAdoo trusts, um, the receivers now that he has, I think he, he trusts Cody. Um, that that's evident, right. But, um, again, I think that he's, there's just, there's balance there. There's, uh, there's the development of the young talent that's, that's maturing and stuff like that. And it's all, it's all sort of mixed in this little pot and, and, you know, the soup's starting to soups, the soup's on, right. And it's, and it's, and tastes good right now. Well, you, you can't get? eat soup anymore because you're a responsible eater. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, whereas yeah. I'm, I will probably eat, eat the soup, eat the can. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 amazing though because Murray McCormick, who's absent this week, he's in Boston mm-hmm. right now. Um, and we we talked many a time during the spring about you know the Riders really need to get a veteran because vet, veteran quarterback to support mm-hmm. Zach Kalaros because he's fragile and concussions, concussions, yeah. concussions. Sign Kevin Glenn, sign Travis Lule, and and Jeremy O'Day. Right from the outset, was very confident in Cody Fajardo. I'm not sure a lot of people were. Mm-hmm. How has Cody Fajardo being able to do this because this is an amazing story that yeah. uh, uh, people like me didn't see coming, but you're likely more intuitive. Mm. Well, I mean, quarterbacks especially. Co- first of all, Cody Fajardo's had a fantastic opportunity to learn from some really good quarterbacks. Yeah. He's been in systems with with Ricky Ray. He's been in systems with Mike Riley. Like he's uh, or um, yeah, he's been he's been with Lule. He's he's been with a ton of good quarterbacks. You look at him, he's been a primarily a goal line quarterback, but then you look at the rest of the quarterbacks that are that are greats in this league now. Riley, Bo Levi Mitchell, I mean, Matt Nichols, love him or hate him. They're, those are all guys that had to sit for a while and yeah. watch the game and learn the game. And when they got their opportunity, then they went out and, and made those plays. And, and Cody's done a good job. You can tell he's learned a ton from the guys he's been with. And he talked so passionately about short yardage when he first got here. Like you could ask him about short yardage and he could talk endlessly for, you could do a whole podcast with him on short yardage and the entire length of the podcast would sound developmental. Like it it wouldn't be just him stuck on one thing the whole time. And it showed that he understood that you need to be a star in your role. And with what you're given, that's what you need to work with. It's not about, you know, what you're not given. It's about the opportunities that you do have. And he understood that this was the opportunity that he was given to be the backup quarterback here. And he needed to still honor and respect that. So he re- he prepared like the number one QB. And he just took advantage of the opportunity when it was finally given to him. And it was so humbling to hear him say, even with the, all the success that he had had um, when Zach was still here, well, what, when, what happens when Zach comes back? Well, I'm the backup quarterback. Zach gets his, that gets yeah. his role back. And it was genuine. It was, yeah, it, exactly. And that's, be, it's because he understood where he fit, right? But now that he's the number one quarterback bar none, there hasn't been this nervousness about, okay, now it is my team. Now there's no excuse. No, he's, yeah. he looks like he's gone out and he's enjoyed it be, because he's, he understands the process. And you don't understand processes like that if you don't get in r- rooms with guys like Ricky Ray. You know what I mean? And you don't learn from great coaches. He's had great coaching. Yeah, right. And uh, Steve Walsh is obviously a really experienced coach here with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I think Steve's done a good job of, of coaching him up and he's learned, man, that Calgary game was really worrisome mm-hmm. because Calgary literally took all the things that he had been good at leading up to that game and took them off the table. Like literally said, I don't care what you do, Cody, you're not you're not throwing over 15 yards against us. We're putting two safeties back there at all times. Everything long is going to be taken away. And he struggled. But then Hamilton came out and did it and said, okay, we're going to take away your big ball too. What did Cody do? Took the underneath stuff. Yeah. He didn't just say he was going. And he said right after the Calgary game, this is what Calgary did did mm-hmm. to us. Yep. We have to be more patient. We Absolutely. have to take what's there. But it's one thing to say it. But then when you've got 
defensive lineman and linebacker yep. running at you and you're in the heat of the battle and you got a split second to make a decision it's a lot tougher to do but he's done that montreal they, did that too to, to they a, to, were just starting to do it in yeah. montreal too you're you're exactly right i know where you're going with that they you saw them okay you know what we're gonna dink and dunk you then too because yeah. what was montreal doing they were taking away the longer play bailing back into zones and stuff like that and that's what you want to see you just want to see the graduation from from step one to step two to step three. And that's why what made Brandon Bridge so frustrating is because Brandon Bridge wasn't learning. Brandon Bridge was was wasn't watching film on on what he was what he what teams were doing to him and he wasn't adapting to it. Right? You so you saw this just monster arm. You saw this unreal athletic ability, but you weren't seeing the learning. You weren't seeing the steps being made. And Fajardo's done that. So that's so again, to answer your question, your original question about how is Stephen McAdoo doing this, he's doing, and and I said it in the beginning of the year, this is the year that we'll find out what type of OC Stephen McAdoo is. Yeah. And the reason I said that is because you knew the defense wasn't going to be as good. There was no possible way, yeah. especially with Jason Shire. How do you replicate know? that? That's an anomaly you don't, statistically. You don't. And that's why everybody's so mad at it right now. Is oh man, the defense. Just think about it though. I said this on air, I think in the broadcast. Could you imagine this offense here and the special teams and defense from 2018. Oh, my goodness. You asked if there was an elite team, that would that have been That would be it. That's they would have been blowing teams out by 35 in this league, right? So that's that's why you said that. Though, yeah. Because you knew that the defense wasn't going to be as good, and there's still lights out. Special teams has been horrible. And yeah. I, it's it's been horrible. With Craig Dickinson as the head coach, you would never expect that. And yeah. as a special teams coordinator, yeah. obviously. It's so tough. And it's and it's been horrible all over the league. Right again. Yeah. This is not the year of the return. It's the year of the missed tackle. We gotta stop trying to create that narrative that the return games are amazing in Canada because people, the people that know yeah. the football, they're gonna look at it. If it was so good, then trust me, we're gonna lose all the special teams returners to the NFL next year. Yeah. Well, well, <laughs> well I hope one goes to Denver because they've got River Craycraft, <laughs> <laughs> River Craycraft returning punts. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go on that tangent. That's funny. Um, you know, you talked about the mentors that Cody Fajardo had and the ta- the apprenticeship that he served and what a sponge he was. And I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I hear all that. And I think, hmm, Darian Durant, 2006, coached by Con- Tommy Condell. Darian Durant, 2007, coached by Kent Austin. Those Both those years, Kerry Joseph and Marcus Crandall, two tremendous pros and, mm-hmm. and, and accomplished quarterbacks in their mm-hmm. own right, both Grey Cup winners, yeah. were ahead of him on the depth chart both years. 2008, Darian Durant gets his chance week two in Vancouver, mm. seizes it. Uh, there was a blip because of the rib injury that year, mm. but and he looked like he was made for it. And yeah. when his time came, he seized that opportunity. It's dangerous to compare Cody Fajardo after seven starts to Darian Durant, mm. who's, I mean, he's Darian Durant. Mm. But if you look at the early years and the progression and the mentorships mm. and, the, and the comportment of Cody Fajardo compared to Darian Durant at comparable stages in their careers, mm. I see some parallels. Do you? Um, yeah, I think Cody's arm's a little bit better. Um, and, and that's a surprise, too, because Cody didn't come into camp yeah. displaying this monster arm. Like, he didn't – like, in June, I was just like, yeah, he's – I mean, he's right, making some good decisions. But there was no monster arm involved in Cody's no. camp. And all of a sudden, he's coming out here, and he's making every throw in, in the books, and it's it's looked impressive. So, I think he's a, got a bit better arm than doubles. But you're right. I think he's I think he's tough. And and that's what doubles is renowned for is just mm-hmm. being one of the toughest quarterbacks out there. Um, he can obviously run, right? But yeah, he's a leader. Like when doubles was in the locker room, man, there there was he was one of those guys that everybody liked, right? And I think Cody's one of those guys that you know, no matter where you're from and who you are and what type of person, what type of character you are, the those franchise quarterbacks, everybody gets along with them, right? Yeah. And Cody seems like that type of guy too. But you're right. I mean, it's unfair to 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 compare him to Darian Durant. If if you ask him, I don't think he wants to be compared to Darian Durant because you don't want to be the next Darian. Durant. No. you want to be the first Cody, right? So, but I look at the 2008 Durant, and if you look at the 2008 Durant and compare it, compare him to the 2019 Cody mm-hmm. Fajardo, I think there's some parallels. Even if you look at the early stages, mm-hmm. I mean, Darian got his opportunity one day in Hamilton yeah. as a first at first start and lit it up. Yeah. And then they play Montreal the next week. He goes toe to toe with Anthony Calvillo. And they went to 41-33. Yeah. Then there's the rib injury the next week against Toronto. But you could see right from the outset that Darian was ready for it. Even when talking to the media, he was composed. He mm. was nothing frazzled him. He was ready for it. And it's because, you were his teammate at the time. And, you, and it was because even then, Darian, Darian was a great teammate. 
Uh, I remember in 2007 when when we were having all that success and we had that great cup year. Um, a lot of people don't realize that when Steve, Coach Austin, I almost called him Steve Austin. When Coach <laughs> Austin um, was making hard decisions, like he would literally call doubles. Doubles, what do you think? Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Doubles was was one of the guys that were in there, was in there helping and because he saw the field so well. Right. And I remember wow. was, we remember sitting there and watching Austin go back and forth with doubles and the rest of the crew. But he would he would literally he would weigh doubles decision on what doubles said on how he was going to, you know, dictate what what Carrie did. Really? Oh, yeah. Doubles was a fantastic teammate. He got up there in 2007, right before the Great Cup, the night before the Great Cup game. And Coach Austin basically gave the team the floor. Anybody who got up and wanted to get up and talk, got up and talked and just let their heart play. It was one of the best things that we've ever done. But you know what? Darian got up. This is the third string quarterback. Double stood up. And you know what he said? He said, we need to win this for KJ. And he went over really? the, the things that, that he, he learned from KJ. He, learned, he went over the things that what made KJ so special. He went over the things that made what made the team so special. And right there, we were watching him. And I was, me and him were boys. But I was like, man, yeah, that, that's why he's going to be special. Right? Man. So, yeah, and I, you're right. I think you see some of those in Fajardo. The way he talks to the media, it's not one of those fronts. I know a bunch of guys. I've I've seen a bunch of guys that talk to media one day and and, and are total opposites. You know, when they're not talking to the media, not Cody. You could tell that's genuine. Uh, I'm in, I'm in the mood today to compare people to ride legendary writer quarterback. Mm. So I'm going to compare you to Ron Lancaster. And hear me <laughs> out. Hear me out on yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, what size is the size? <laughs> <laughs> when Ronnie did uh, work for CBC doing, mm. doing uh, color. And his test was always, does Bev understand, his wife Bev understand what he's talking about? Mm. Because you've got to take the, a very complex game with 24 moving pieces within three or four seconds mm. and, and explain it to the, to the layman. And that's, uh, to me, virtually impossible to do. But Ronnie would try to make it comprehensible to the average fan. And after every broadcast he did, he would phone his wife Bev Mm. Say, Bev, did you understand what I'm talking about? I'm not saying this to demean Bev, but she's a, mm. she's an average fan, yeah. and and if Bev understood what he was talking about, then he felt like he'd done his job. Mm. What you, what I really marvel at with what you've been able to do in such a short time at CKRM is take this game without the benefit of visuals. Mm. You've got to describe this on the radio, unless you know you're on Channel Seven or mm. uh, the Rider Rider uh, Rider uh, website. But you've got to take this complex game and explain it to people without the benefit of a pen and paper, without the benefit of a whiteboard and make people understand it. Like Ronnie was able to make it comprehensible. And there's times I'm, I'm many times I'm listening to CKRM, whether it's the pregame show or the sports cage. And it's like, I can see this unfolding. I know what he's talking about, even though I can't, I don't yeah. have it in front of me. How do you boil it down like that? Because that's, I, I don't know how you do it. I think it's just tremendous. Well, Hey, thank you. Um, B and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I just know that I know that when I got the opportunity, I knew why it was such an important opportunity. And it wasn't because I love to talk sports. It was such a big opportunity because in Saskatchewan, this fan base is just so hungry for football and they're so passionate. So you knew that whatever you did say, you better be able to make sense of it. You better be able to actually have that really be true because they were going to listen and they were going to call you if it was BS. Right. Um, and, and they wanted, they, there's a general urge to learn about the game. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't even taken, I wouldn't have done radio in Toronto. There would be no point. Nobody was, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like even the Argos commentator, people that were listening would just be listening matter of factly. This audience here in Saskatchewan and the people who were fans of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, they want to know, you know, they want to know football. They want to, they want to be there. And that was really special to me. So I don't know if it's, you know, and you know, I'll tell you the truth. I might actually start stealing that, uh, <laughs> that Ron Lancaster thing, but it would require my <laughs> wife actually listening to a game. <laughs> Um, my wife doesn't read my stuff. Yeah, either, don't worry so. about it. Neither does mine. My, my, <laughs> it's hilarious. My wife will be gonna come home. I'll come home and she'll be like, "So what happened?" Like, oh. <laughs> like not even one minute. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, but that's that's why she's my wife. I, I love it. Tell you the truth. But um, 
yeah, it was never like, hey, you have to dumb it down. Even though you do a little bit, I felt like dumb it down would be disrespect. I just look yeah. at it as a huge opportunity to, te- to, 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 to give back something to an audience that gave me so much. Like, I mean, I, when people, you know, people, it's one of those sayings where when you're like, well, I heard Luke's a bit of a bit of a jerk. Well, I heard Luke's a really nice guy. I, I, you should probably uh, believe them both because I, a lot of the times I, I give the energy that I get. Yeah. Right. But I've changed so much because of the people of Saskatchewan, my friends, my teammates, my teammates are amazed that this is what I'm doing now. Really? Oh, they, they could. Yeah. I talked, talked to Nate Davis. He's like, yeah, you're the dead last person that I thought would ever do anything like this. And it made me feel good. Cause the next thing Nate said, he's like, but I'm proud of you. Um, this audience here is important. They are needed in the Canadian football league. They are the standard bearer of the Canadian football league. So if you have a mic, that's why I respect you so much consistency. So if you have a mic, then you better be a, you better be prepared and B you have to have something substantial. You have to bring them something because they want to, right? You know what I mean? Like if, if, if someone's coming over to your house for dinner and they're really excited because they know you can cook, what well, you're not going to, you're not going to order out. You know what I'm saying? They could order out at home, right? They could, there's, there's other options in Saskatchewan. There's, there's, there's plenty of people that people can listen to if they want. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if it's I don't know what it is, man. I just I just know that I I really respect the people in this province that listen to football, that watch football because I know they're so passionate about it. So I don't want to let them down if, if by coming on there and, you know, like if I'm just spitting out words from my old coaches and stuff yeah. like that, I could go and be like, "Oh yeah, this is a simple tackle tight end stunt here to the right. They they they're in 70 protection here uh on the offensive line, the center doesn't even see the right you can say, but and that's that happens not, all the time if you just listen to general football yeah, discussion. Yeah, but that's not that's not that's not what they want to hear. That's not, you know, we've got farmers and we got farmers out here that work on their crops all day. And and they 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 tune into a radio station and listen all day. Like they're the hardest working people I've ever seen. And they're people that no matter how hard they work, um they're still at the mercy of weather. Like that's football. Yeah. You can control the things that you can control. You can work out as hard as you can. You can, you can know the game plan as hard as you, uh, right. You can know ins and outs of what the opponent's doing. And then you could get there and someone could get hurt or it could pour rain and change. The t- right. Yeah. Like farmers are a lot like football players, but man, they're, they're dedicated. They, they, they listen. They're, they're passionate They're and they're working so hard They're So why, when they're working as hard as they work, right. Why would I get on air and disrespect them by just throwing out a bunch of jargon? You know what I mean? And I just feel like it w- I wouldn't be taken seriously. I feel like I wouldn't be bringing anybody anything that they might like or, you know, might make them think about the other side of things. Like right? I know about as much about football strategy as I do flying a 767. Mm-hmm. I've been watching the Riders uh, since, well, this is my 50th season of watching the Riders with some degree of interest. Mm-hmm. Um, i I'm obsessed with this football team, but I don't pretend to understand the X's and O's. And when I do try to pretend that, that's when I get burned. Mm-hmm. And and that's why I make a point of listening to what you do, because I feel that whether you're on the air for five minutes or just between a play or for a segment with Derek Taylor, I'm going to know, I'm going to learn something mm-hmm. when I'm listening. I'm going to learn something about the game. I'm going to learn something about the way this team is trending, what it needs to do, what it's doing well. Mm-hmm. And I've, I figure I'm not doing my job if I don't listen to you doing your job. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, I feel like, and, um, Oh, I, I heard, I heard, um, one of the NBA analysts say this, but you know, our job is to analyze, not antagonize. Mm-hmm. And I feel that there's some, you know, some people get it confused where they, they think that they're portraying themselves. Like they think that people are there for a character. No, people are there because they love the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, Right. And they love football. That's so, you know what I mean? And even I struggled with that because to be honest with you, Rob, in the first two years or the first year, my, my main problem was I had too many thoughts and I try to get them all out yeah. on one play. 
right? Because I wanted to be as prepared as possible. And that was, right? And I had really had to learn, like, look, just focus on one thing. It's hard. I know you got ADHD, you got everything going wrong, but man, focus on one thing. And the second year, I really felt like I was, there was times where I would not on purpose, but subconsciously take on the character of my favorite color analyst, like John Gruden, Troy Aikman, you know what I mean? Charles Davis, um, um, Mark, uh, man, I can't remember his last name, but, uh, he's an NBA player. He's an analyst. Mark now. Jackson. Yeah. I don't know why I couldn't Mark Jackson. Right. And then, so now this third year I've come in and the only, one of the only things I have on my roster and note things is, is, is a, a phrase that coach Edgeberry um, taught us and ingrained in us in 2009, 2010, be yourself. Everyone else is taking. Right. So, um, that's, I think is helping. But man, it's just, it's just genuinely fun knowing that there's people taking you pretty seriously. There's some people that don't like you. There's some people that do like you, but man, they've got to respect you because you're prepared. Well, I remember in 96 when I was named, I was named the leader post sports columnist in the middle of the, of the season. Is it, is it <laughs> I heard music in the background. Can the audience hear that? And, um, I thought, okay, I've got to be Bob Hughes. Bob Hughes was a legend at the mm. leader post. I'm now the leader post sports columnist. I've got to be Bob Hughes. Yeah. And I tried to be something that I'm not. No. And if I look at my stuff from 96, 97, it's like I'm impersonating a columnist. It took me a while to be true to myself, yeah. which isn't this necessarily this basher. Uh, I like to, I like to use a lot of, a lot of humor. Bob used humor as well. I like to use sarcasm. Bob used sarcasm. But as soon as I stopped trying to be that Robert and realized I have to be this Robert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was different, but that took a period of years and it still evolves. But you've, if you're not yourself, people can spot a phony a mile away. Man, you're absolutely right. And that was the first thing I knew that like, man, I was asked to take over a role held by Carm Carteri. <laughs> like, get out of here. Like, no, errant. like no one's going to like you, Luke. I knew it. Like yeah. it wasn't going to happen. Right. You know what I mean? There wasn't one thing I was going to be able to do that first or year or even, you know, through the first few years, there were some people that literally grew up with Carm Carteri in their ear. And that was amazing. It's part of the reason we love Carm. Like Carm's one of us. And Carm, we looked at Carm when we were on the sidelines, when we were practicing, when we were playing, man. Carm was was a guy that we wanted to be like. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just because he had, you know, we saw a guy who had done it all and stuff like that. And look, he's 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 out here talking with us and stuff. It was pretty cool. Um, and so that's why I I I made a self I promised myself, look, I I don't know how it's gonna go on air. I don't know, right? Still don't know. Um, but I know this, I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to be the most prepared in the Canadian football league. There's not going to be one situation out here. I don't know that I, I, I don't know how to talk about. Right. And there's not going to be one time where I don't have a feeling of what the opponent's going to do or the riders are going to do. I'm going to be prepared. So I pour all my time into watching film. I don't pay attention to the numbers as much. Thankfully, Derek's here now. I don't have to pay attention <laughs> to him at all. You know what I'm I mean? going to get to do my taxes. Yeah. I, I watch, I watch the film over and over and I just tried it right you know what I mean because yeah. that's what I'm used to from being a player so I knew that hey I wasn't coming in as the new Carm Carteri there was no possible way and if I tried to be the new Carm Carteri they would hate me even more right but I knew if I was prepared I would have a chance no matter how it fared so that's been cool is is knowing that preparation has been my ally and my asset but uh it's been an honor too man like to be able to say that you were you you, you had to you had to be asked you were the guy after a legend oh man i i felt like you and bob yeah. hughes man it probably wasn't easy for you either right no. but uh i remember talking with bob in this very room yeah and i never got past the oh my goodness that's bob hughes i was at his wedding yeah in in, in 2050 2005 i never i never completely got past oh my goodness that's bob hughes yeah, yeah, and yeah. now i'm doing what bob did i don't pretend to be bob hughes but the key was not pretending to be bob yes yeah. yeah exactly you just do what you've got to be true to yourself and and you've got to work yeah. You know, I, I, I put in long days and, and I do that because I just feel that's what a Bob taught me. And that's what yeah. Greg Drennan taught me. And that's what you got to do. Be yourself. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Yeah. Etch hammered that home into us so much over the years that he was with the riders, that Tad Cornegay tatted it on his ribs. <laughs> like that's how much we, you know, so that was, that was, and that's from football. 
right? But that was my thing. That like I took every single day I came to work, I learned something. Whether whoever my defensive coordinator was, whoever was my D line coach, I, whoever my head coach was, I learned something. So I feel like that's the responsibility when you're in media and you're in the kind of analyst role for CKRM um, or whoever. If I'm on this podcast, it's okay. Well, you learn something new every day. If you're talking and someone else isn't learning something new, then what are you doing? Yeah. You know, like you, you've got to put back in what you got. So I think that's just, man, I'm just trying to give back to, 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 a, to a culture and to a group of people that really helped me grow as a person. That's what's fun, right? That is, it's, yeah. a, it's a great gig, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, man. It's honestly, it's the best gig in the world, man. It's, uh, it's funny because um, in, my, in my real life, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the manager for corporate partnerships within the province of Saskatchewan. We're, we're on a national team and I handle a couple of our national partnerships and, uh, and I work in this fantastic group. But man. Um, I'm, I feel so at home when I, when I'm talking ball and I'm around Ryder nation. And uh, it was funny. I talked to, uh, uh, Marco Brulette, um, who's recently retired and now yeah. does the color for the Montreal Alouettes. I saw him, I gave him each other a hug. And the first thing I said is, uh, I was like, well, well, do you love it? He goes, look, this is the greatest thing. <laughs> he goes, I love this. And he's a lawyer and he's like, well, cause obviously he can bill his hours in any part of the world. Right. Yeah. But man, when you come out of the game, you don't, you don't miss the game. Like, man, I watched them warm up and my hamstring hurts. You know what I mean? Like I don't <laughs> miss any part of the game. You just miss the locker room. You miss talking ball with your buddies. You know, you miss like, you know, if I got frustrated and I threw my helmet across the locker at the Canadian Red Cross, uh, there would be people that would call HR. There would be people <laughs> that move their offices. There'd be people that complained. Right. Like, you're like Terry Tate, in, office linebacker. That Yeah. Like, there, you do that in the locker room and be like, hey, dude, you almost hit me with the helmet, man. What the hell? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's totally different. And that's what you miss. So being able to still talk ball, being able to, you know, um, be close to football and close to an organization and, and things like that. It's just, it helps you move on with your life because on the flip side, I got teammates that I used to play with that they're not doing so well. You know what I mean? They miss football. They miss all aspects of football and, and they don't necessarily have people to talk about it with, especially the ones in the States. Right. So yeah, man. So that's whenever you have a chance to reach out to some of those guys, it's good to hear them, but you also know that, Hey man, it's, it's, they're they're good they're glad to hear you because they they go through the same things but they can't talk well at all you know what i mean so i feel blessed this is this is great i'm living my best life man as the kids say well, <laughs> we're very blessed that you lent us all, all those insights and, and yeah well, i hope i didn't just get on here and start blabbing no man. this was, was great like, this right. is this was honestly <laughs> tremendous i would i would love to do this again hey any thousand times anytime, and replace man. myself as host and just let you anytime <laughs> let you anytime. go uh, luke it. is there anything you'd like to add before we sign off today just thank you man i think you're doing great things and again uh man all respect in the world man you you uh it's consistency with you and i hope that uh, i get some consistency going in my own as i as i do this football thing man oh, yeah, you're gonna get, the you're gonna have my 33 years doing this plus <laughs> there you go <laughs> I don't think I got 33 left. Uh, Luke Molliner, thank you so much. I'm Rob Vanstone, and we will do this next week with number 64. Take care and have a great day.